Yeah, yeah, let's do it. We live. Are we on the air? Are we on the air? Hey, 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 hey. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another exciting episode of the Blue Experience. You know how we do it. We bring you unique content. We bring you airline content and other things as well, too. You never know, man. We were, you guys were with us last week. We were talk, what were we talking about last week? Uh, we had... Um, <coughs> A good discussion with uh, the AQ20 mod from, um, no, come on, man. Been yeah, yeah, playing freaking Fly by Wire was on the show last Fly week. Fly by Wire, exactly. We had a great discussion with the uh, Fly by Wire team here. But this week, we have another great discussion lined up in store for you guys. It's going to be a good one, man. And absolutely also uh, pleased to announce that we are currently now on Spotify. So if you guys want to check all the past episodes and the future episodes, if you have a Spotify account, sign up. You can now listen to this podcast on Spotify. And we have iTunes and another platform coming soon after that one. So just to let you guys know, we are branching out and getting more ears and more eyes on the stuff that we're doing here today. But anyway, today's show, guys, today's show, we have a special guest. And this special guest is also an airline person. We have to find out if they're a simming person as well. However... They do stuff in the airport that we sometimes take for granted or don't think about. And uh, what I like about uh, what this person does is give us a different insight of what goes on on the airport other than the flight attendants and the pilots. We have a safety and regulatory compliance auditor. I know it's a lot. It's a mountainful. So (laughs) Uh, my man DJ is with us today. He is an SCR auditor for a major cargo airline company. Uh, I, I, it might be more than that. We'll talk about that. <laughs> and he's here to discuss with us the things that he does on in his end of um, the airport. And we're going to get a discussion going on today. So, DJ, welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much what for up, DJ? With your presence. Absolutely. Thank you for coming on the show, man. How are you doing today? Doing good. Doing good, y'all. Uh, thanks for having me on here, Blue and XP. Excited to talk to y'all and share some knowledge. Absolutely. Let me just say this before uh, we continue. I met DJ through a friend. And uh, at a party, as a matter of fact, and somebody mentioned, hey, XP does this airplane simming thing. And most people look at me like, you do, you do what? But DJ was, DJ was like, what? Really? That's cool, man. I work at the airport and I do X, Y, Z. I'm like, really? And so DJ and I struck up a conversation. If you guys remember, there's a picture I showed maybe six months ago or so off the interior of the, um, what was it? The 7-4 Dreamlifter. And I said to you guys, hey, what is this right here? DJ, who is the one who I got the picture from, he sent it to me because he was in the cargo hold of an empty 74 Dream Dreamlifter. So, wow. DJ, how the heck do you get a picture inside a Dreamlifter with nothing in it, man? <laughs> what are you doing? Welcome aboard, DJ. Hey, hey, how's it going? So, um, yeah, we actually um, had the Dreamlifter down at the airport I worked at. It was actually there for maintenance. So, I was lucky enough to uh, run over there, get inside, and really explore that thing. And, Got to show XP and try to get him to guess and see what it was. And it still mind blows everyone. It looks like a, a gym auditorium. You could play a pickup game of basketball in there or something. But it really is mind blowing how big that thing is. Wow. 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 Was it fully opened up? This is what the nose comes up on the Dream Lifter as well, or is it a tail? So the nose on a Dream Lifter doesn't actually open up. Uh, there's actually special equipment that actually swings the tail back open. And so the loading is actually done from the tail, not actually through the nose on the Dreamlifter. And it's actually crazy. If you see the amount of rivets on the nose of the Dreamlifter, it is amazing. So it's different than with the standard 7.4, I suppose. Oh, very different. Jeez, Jeev. So I was uh, this week, um, Blue was like, what was the title again of you do? And I, I reached out to you like, <laughs> yeah, my official title is Safety and Regulatory Compliance Auditor. What is that? And where in the airport do you work? What do you do, man? Did, if you could you explain to our audience, what is it that you actually do in your day-to-day job? Because you, you told me that you fly all over the world doing a bunch of stuff. But what is that title about? Uh, how did it come about? <clears throat> Uh, so as a safety and regulatory compliance auditor, working for a specific airline, um, preparing the airline for what potentially an FAA auditor could come and inspect on our airline. And in, in day-to-day, um, going to the job for me, if I'm at my home base, and I'm just going out to the airport auditing the arrivals and the departures. But a lot of the times I'm actually on the road that, like XP said, whether it be domestically or internationally, going to these different airports and 
actually auditing our different vendors. And so what I do in my auditing, it's mostly ground operation stuff, as XP said. It's kind of a different perspective, kind of the main points that you all talked about in the past. And there's really a lot of behind the scenes, uh, specifically uh, weight and balance, um, dangerous goods, the warehouse, the cargo buildup, and all that. Um, and uh, we'll dive into some more of that later. Is. So you're, now, you're the also, guy that I don't want to see on the ramp, right? Like yep. you're the one we're all avoiding. <laughs> <laughs> the auditor is always the bad guy, but hey, the auditor shouldn't be the bad guy. Whenever I go out on the road, I'm first thing I tell people is, I mean, we're all on the same team. Aviation safety is, um, we're always learning in the world of safety today. SMS with safety management systems. There's always something to be learned, always something to be uh, taken. And aviation safety and info share is what builds this safety community. And that, that's a big thing that I, I really enjoy about this job. Is. Uh, also, you said uh, you are uh, load balance, correct? Uh, weight and balance, load and balance, load master. There you go, load master. Yeah. <laughs> load right. master, yeah. So um, obviously to perform the audits that I conduct, um, they want us to be qualified to perform that function. Obviously, in my day-to-day -day job, I'm not actually out there loading the planes, doing the weight and balance. I'm observing that. But obviously, to perform the audits, I need to be very competent in what they're doing and being able to obviously st stop the operation if something's unsafe. But definitely, the regulatory items is our big thing that we're looking at out there. Uh, what when you're on the ramp um, as a um, auditor? What specifically, like, what are the specific things that you're looking for or looking at that we wouldn't even think to, you know, that that's being observed? What do you, what do you look at? Uh, big things. Um, Blue's probably familiar with this with uh, his ground handling experiences. You, there's a lot of complacency on the ramp, so <laughs> you really got to stick to what's in the manuals and follow those procedures. For for an easy example, I mean bringing up a belt loader to the aircraft. You want to have your marshaler bring that up so you don't end up running a belt loader into the plane, damaging the aircraft. Um, I was telling XP the other day, uh, one of the main things that drives my job is there's so much that happens on the ground with these aircraft. And everything that happens on the ground can potentially affect the safety of flight. So that's, that's kind of what has driven my passion for what I'm doing in my career. And uh, so some other items that we look at is obviously um, ground handling procedures per the airline's manuals. And then we'll actually take a look at um, the warehouse operations, whether that's the cargo buildup. Um, specifically, I mean, we have dangerous goods too, and that's um, no tox. So it's, that's the uh, information of what we tell the pilots is on board dangerous goods. There's ERG codes, which is an emergency response guides to if there is an in-flight incident with the dangerous goods on board. So the, the flight ops or the pilots would know exactly how to handle it, get on, get on the radio with ATC. Hey, we, we might have this issue with, this dangerous goods, and the first thing they'll ask is what are the ERG codes and start prepping stuff for on the ground. So that's kind of a short snippet uh, broadly with the ground handling procedures, the warehouse, dangerous goods. Those are some main items that we'll look at on audits. Actually sounds really familiar because we had an auditor not long ago uh, come to our uh, our operation too. And uh, we actually did a really good job, but they didn't have any, uh, we didn't like fail. <laughs> so it was, it was really good. But no write-ups. Exactly. Yeah. No write-ups. We did. We actually passed. We did good. Um, there was a couple of corrections here and there, but it was like small things. But uh, I definitely agree with you on that. And the ramp, just like any other job, uh, has people who don't care about their jobs. Um, you know, like me, I, I mean, I love aircraft. I love aviation. I love planes. I love being around planes. And so I take it seriously. And I understand the kind of the bigger picture of things because of flight sim, honestly. I, flight sim helps me see the bigger picture of what's going on in the in the the cockpit was going on around as far as ATC other aircraft around us but people who are just kind of in there for the job just there for the benefits for the travel benefits whatever that may be they don't care about all that stuff right so uh, like you said they get very complacent because it is a very uh what's the word uh when you do things over and over and over um uh, mundane I don't know. Well, but yeah, the job is the same. It's basically every plane comes in and you do the same thing over and over and over, especially with us because we only work with Airbuses. So the Airbuses are all built very, very, very same. But if you're running, rocking ERJs and Boeings and some 747s stuff like that, it might give you some variety. Um, but it's very um, repetitive is the word I'm looking for. And so people get gotcha. very, like you said, complacent. 
they they'll skip steps in safety because we all go through all this training that tells us about how to be safe around the aircraft and do things safely even though it takes us longer to do our job because of some of these safety rules um you know we tend to sometimes want to skip little things here and there and that's where like you come in as an auditor you come and look at us and watch us do those things and be like hey you make sure you you know have somebody guide you in to the plane the belt load to the plane or whatever that action may be and i think also uh, the unsafest plane, the unsafest place for a plane to be is on the ground. Ah, didn't think about that. Never heard about that. Wow. <laughs> Makes sense, yeah, right? Most, most definitely. I think um, Blue hit that one on the head. Um, the ramp is a very dangerous place, um, not only with complacency, but for some, a lot of people it is. It is a job to go out there. Um, me and Blue probably consider us lucky, like what we said, as aviation lovers, to be out there around these aircraft um, daily. But just on an aircraft arrival when an aircraft arrives to a gate and you have these engines spooling up obviously your beacon lights still on you have an you have an engine running i mean people don't realize the the intake on these engines and what could potentially happen so the ramp is a very dangerous place and like blue said when we go out there it is it is almost like a little check that we're doing on there and like i was saying we're on the same team we want everyone to come to work that day and then we want them to obviously go home safe to their family so that's that's the name of it name of the game right there i literally hear that quote almost every day from my station manager <laughs> yeah <laughs> we want to all go home to our families which sounds like a military phrase but it's true <laughs> Jeez. Uh, captain dennis in chat says hey have you ever um done safety audit at uh, raleigh durham gate c10 because he works for gat g-a-t <clears throat> i guess like a ground handling service in raleigh uh, do you do raleigh uh, at all or no so not at Raleigh. Um, I am familiar with GAT, um, but I have never actually done an audit with um, GAT specifically as a vendor at Raleigh Durham. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, let me ask you this, though. Are you the good guy on the job or the bad guy on the job that nobody wants to see when you walk around? Yeah, so that's kind of what I was saying, too. When I, when I first get to an audit, um, I'll meet the station personnel, everyone that's there, introduce yourself. Kind of people are a little bit hesitant to talk to you at first, you know, it, it is kind of the bad cop thing. But like what I was kind of hinting at earlier, it's we're all on the same team here. Like Blue was saying, his auditor came out there and was giving him some little tips and maybe some little procedural deviations. Obviously, if we're out there, we're going we're gonna to help you out there. If something's big and major and needs to be fixed, in that case, something needs to be written up and we need to have a, a corrective action. And so when we get these corrective actions, that can simply um, be in the form of a, a read and sign, briefings, Anything to distribute this information that the auditor on site sees a deviation from policy or maybe an unsafe act with equipment or whatever it may be. And that's kind of the steps that we take to get these corrective actions and get the procedures in line, because that's just coming back to the complacency on the ramp. And I mean, it, it's the name of the game just to have a safe, thorough operation where we don't run into anyone getting hurt. And like what we said, we want everyone to go home safe to their families. It's the holidays. We don't need any of that. So I have a question. Um, I like to promote yeah. different types of aviation jobs. Um, and yours is a job that I, I don't hear much about, right? It is an aviation job. You work around the airport, you work with aircraft, you are an important part to make sure you're in keeping aircraft safe and passenger safe and cargo safe. Uh, and so my question is, uh, you know, there's lots of aviation jobs that there's, there's air traffic control, but there's an age limit on that, which is crazy. I'm not sure why, but there is an age limit on becoming a real life air traffic controller. Um, there's obviously the ramp stuff you could do, which is what I do right now. You could uh, be a gate agent. You could be you could work at the restaurant, which is not really, I wouldn't recommend that at all. Um, you know, you could be a flight attendant. You could be a pilot. You could be multiple types of pilots. But like your job as an auditor, a safety auditor for like, you know, an airline and whatnot, how do you get into that? Like, how did you fall into that? That that you just were you just born like I want to be an auditor. I want to judge people for life. Like was <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, good question. I will go on a little bit of rant here. Um, so I, I've always loved aviation. I have a little bit of my own flight time. And uh, my mom, um, she was an air traffic controller. I've always loved aviation. Like what I said, oh. I actually studied um, Homeland Security and emergency preparedness. And from there, right after school, I went out and actually took an internship. Wait, 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 pause, period. pause, sorry. Yep. You studied what in oh. college? <laughs> so, yeah, it's going to throw you off a little bit, but I, I'll get into the story. So, okay. Homeland Security and an emergency preparedness. That's a course okay. in college? Yep. So, I have my bachelor's in that, actually. Wow. Wow. 
Nice. What was your goal? Right. Like, I mean, I know I'm sorry I'm cutting your story off, but it was just like my mind is like you went to, you went to college for Homeland. Were you trying to be like, uh, you know, FBI or you're you trying to be a, what do you call that guy who protects the president? The Secret Service? Like, what, what, were you, what, were you, what was your actual original goal? Uh, honestly, uh, like when I first did went to school, my, my four year degree, I had a finance uh, degree and I went and talked to my advisor and I started talking to him and kind of changed up my interests. And obviously a lot of the people that I went to school with, they're working for government agencies. So at first I thought, yeah, I'd go into the Department of Homeland Security um, and it's so- something, something like that. So I kind of, I, I like to think that I really did get a good opportunity to take um, my degree and transform it over to, so with my degree, and I actually took an internship right out of school in safety and security. So that's kind of where this is going to start churning, and you'll see. So when I first went out to this internship, I thought it would more be so on the aviation security side of the house. And uh, when I got there and started uh, working hands-on with this carrier, I started really getting into safety. And actually, part of this uh, safety, um, safety duties I was doing as an intern was a lot of emergency response. And so that was directly from my degree and just actually taking that degree and kind of shifting it into an aviation focus, which is actually really cool with whether it be a lot of people don't realize um, if a, a, uncircum, uh, a circumstance well, it would be awful, obviously, for any carrier would be to have an incident. Uh, emergency response is kind of behind the scenes and a lot of carriers will actually have drills company-wide drills for these events if it would happen. Yep. So I got to be involved with a lot of that. And then, um, Kind of got more involved on the safety side. I actually um, did a lot with the ASAP and fatigue programs too, and really got kind of hands on with safety. Um, so, and then actually from there to kind of turn this specifically to ground safety, where I'm at now in my career, I was actually um, a safety investigator for ground incidents and damages. So, kind of investigating, say we get a hotline call where there was a damage to an aircraft that the belt loader hit it. I was that person investigating, getting the statements, looking at the training records for these people, looking at any contributing factors, the root cause. And then from there, you get mitigations back and you mitigate the risk. So from there, um, I was in that role for a little while. And there's some more to it with the it, or with the investigator role. Um, as far as SMS, um, it's 2021 now. It's It's got to be SMS is um, implemented at all airlines, uh, mandated by the FAA now. So obviously along SMS? with SMS, and oh sorry for that. Um, SMS is safety management systems, okay. and there's four okay. pillars to S, four pillars to SMS. And so obviously it starts with um, your safety policy, and then uh, and then it goes into your safety policy. Obviously is what your, your policy, your safety policy. So going into the next one, it's your safety risk management, and your risk management would include obviously mitigations. From there, it's your quality assurance. So your quality assurance on your mitigation that you would put into place. And the last pillar of SMS, uh, safety management systems, is your safety promotion. Kind of that complacency we were talking about, that promotion of safety, kind of getting that full loop is really the, kind of the thing that brings it all together. So from there, I had a, my passion kind of for ground safety. And like I was saying, everything you do on the ground can potentially affect the safety of flight. And then from there, um, I kind of saw the investigation side before SMS hazard reporting kind of moved over to this compliance and auditing role. And yeah, that's where, um, that's where I'm at today. Wow. Jeez. I, I, I'm listening to you here. So just just listening keenly to everything you're saying, I think you're cut out for this job, man. I think, <laughs> I think you're living your passion, I swear. I think it takes a certain kind of personality to have that eye and that ear for just the whole management and risk and safety stuff going on. I mean, what do you think, Blue? Am I am I making it up? I couldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You know, you said your mom's an air and traffic controller, which takes a certain breed to do that. But I think what you're doing is like a special talent. You know, uh, a lot of us guys would just get like, yeah, okay, you know, it's good, whatever. You're like, nah, man, this needs to be strapped down properly. This is what the reg says. This is how we have to do it. And I, I think, yeah. we, yep, go ahead. Yeah, honestly, Blue, um, they say if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And um, love, loving aviation and the safety of it all. I mean, and then obviously going out, being the auditor. I just love being around these aircraft, and especially in the cargo world. You have all these wide bodies. Um, we have four different aircraft in the fleet. Um, so we have seven fours, 
We have triple sevens, seven six, and then we have small aircraft. We actually have some seven threes as well too. So mm. just being around those aircraft on the ramp, I'm in awe every day when I go out there, and I truly do feel like uh, I love it out there. So I, I love it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, 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 wow. Um, how's the traveling part of it? You, you know, um, how does that come about? Do you go down line to another base or where the aircraft is going to leave from? How does that work with the traveling part of it? Uh, so traveling typically, um, obviously, if we're going out to an audit, um, I'll, I'll typically go out on the road about two times a month. We'll take uh, that first week of the month, so to say, for example, we'll get the audit ready, prep. We'll obviously notify the station in advance before we get out there. And then uh, by the time I get out there, I'll usually be out there for a full week. If it's international, we have other stations out kind of in that area. If we're going to go out there, we'll hit a couple of different cities. So we could potentially be out there for five to ten days. So um, domestically, we will travel commercially. But another uh, perk of my job is, uh, as obviously I'm a qualified loadmaster, I do um, have my crew badge. So I do get to jump seat on these aircraft um, all around the world. And that wow. is definitely one of the perks, too, just – sitting in that observer seat right behind the pilots. And like I said, I'm just in awe when I get to go to go to my job and get to travel to all these destinations and be right there up front, shooting these approaches into these, into these cities. It's beautiful, man. I, I know um, I was flying home one time to my home base, actually out of Baltimore and uh, I was jump seating in a seven, six and we had just mm-hmm. taken off and it was about three o'clock in the morning, just seeing a shooting star from the flight deck go right across the sky. It was beautiful up there, man. So just little moments like that really do kind of bring me back home of how much I enjoy this job. That is a dream right there. <laughs> yeah, I'm jealous. <laughs> you get to ride jump seat with literally probably barely to no actual pilot training. That's amazing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I don't got to fly it, but I'm up there right there with them enjoying all the perks. Wow. Man, man, wow. Did you, uh, I know you went over your history a brief bit. Did you ever consider being a pilot? I mean, you, your mom beat an air traffic control. I mean, how, how was that like growing up around that stuff? You know, is that what you got an interest in, air, in the airline industry at all? Is that what was the major thing? Yeah, definitely. Um, so by the time she was retired with, um, or not, no longer an air traffic controller by the time I was growing up, but she had always um, had aviation heavy in my life. And so... It, it it was um sorry I'm blanking a little bit but uh that's all right but no but I mean as far as have you ever thought about being a pilot let me put it most people oh, okay are, yeah sorry yeah, sorry um so want you to be a pilot I, I mean have you thought about that or no um yeah I I thought about it when I was younger like I said I had some flight time um actually at my latter years of high school where I was learning how to fly and um I do have some hours and I can tell you still too to this day putting up putting an aircraft to full power and taking off on, on your own in real life. That's an amazing experience too. But then circling back to what I was just saying, telling y'all now, I'm um, jump seating. Like I, I do get to experience everything that these pilots are doing and I, I don't have to fly the plane. So um, now I, I know plenty of pilots now and obviously um, I, I really enjoy what I'm doing, but I think being a pilot would be, um, if that's what you want to do, fly, but, I, like I said, I love what I'm doing now. Gotcha. Uh, David in chat says, uh, ask him if he has ever gone to Seattle. Also, as a former loadmaster, the thing that scared me when uh, the auditor and CEO of the company came to Seattle because the station had tons of issues. <laughs> so he's basically saying that he's in Seattle. Have you audited in Seattle? Because he's, uh, you know, they've had issues up there, he was saying. <laughs> Have you? Yeah, actually, a great question, David. Um, I have audited Seattle actually, oh. and uh, it's a good co- it's a good question. Um, if the station does have a lot of issues, there will be some instances where I might get a phone call. Hey, uh, we're having some issues. We need you to go out here and check on the station. Typically, we will do these risk assessments um, where we'll actually kind of look at these statistics and see where our major sort of quote problem child stations are that we'll have planned audits to go to. But say, for instance, if we do have an incident on the ground, whether it be a ground aircraft damage or a lot of, let's say, flight crew reports where they're having issues with, whether it be the marshalling, maybe the pushback, not having wing walkers, simple things like that that we'll notice a trend, then I might get a call and be like, hey, I need you to go to this area and check this out, get feet on the ground and give some reports back. So that that's definitely a case where I can get sent out on the road to some different stations if some stuff is definitely being mentioned and we identify it, then yeah, it can be sent out there. 
I have two questions because we haven't mentioned this yet. Are you allowed to say what airline you work for? Uh, I'd rather not, but there, there could probably be some people that could infer. <laughs> All right. And the second question is the wing walker thing. How many is yep. required at your airline? Because uh, a lot of them, it's two wing walkers are required. Yeah. So with wing walkers, it's a funny thing because obviously when I go out to do these audits, a lot of these vendors, um, or uh, I'll hit on this actually. So obviously wing walkers at the wing tips, but a lot of the times the manuals will actually say, unless if there's, uh, obstacle within 25 feet of a wing tip, then that's when the wing the wind walkers are required. Say if you're out on an open ramp parking, there's some situation, especially with some airlines manuals and their books, where they might not be required to have wind walkers. Another instance, um, I can I can say I was doing an audit in JFK, and um, congestion in JFK, even on the cargo side, can be a lot of stuff, whether it be stage freight or other aircraft, where we'd be pushing back in a tight alley or something and we might be encroaching the tail of another aircraft with our tail, then we'll, we'll put a wing walker, or I guess not a wing walker, but someone at the tail to walk and be able to stop that pushback if we encroach that other aircraft. So obviously, yeah, you're most, most likely going to have two, but there are instances where you might put somebody at the tail. Okay. How, how long is the training to just memorize the regs? I mean, I guess you're going off of the FAA regs, right? So how long does it take you from start to finish when you get the job? I mean, do you do an intern? Do you follow somebody else's lead for a while? How long does it take you to know all the regs that you need to know? So right off the bat, you can spot it right and go, haha, that's not right. How long does it take? When I first took the job, actually, um, wasn't able to, I guess, you don't actually fully get the job until you pass your training. And that's a full three weeks of training. And that's got obviously going through this whole low master course to be weight and balance qualified. And the thing with that too, is they actually put you through dangerous goods, obviously too. And so if you don't get through dangerous goods, they're not going to put you through the rest of that class of weight and balance and being a fully qualified load master. So it definitely takes some time to obviously go through the course. And I, I will say that when I first came, it, it does seem overwhelming when you're taking that course. A lot of times to um, switching over from passenger side to cargo, a lot of it did sound foreign, but I will say now going out, having a bunch of audits under my belt now, it is, it is easy to go out there and kind of know the things that you're looking for, especially on the regulatory side where you are trying to protect not only the company, but the safety of the aircraft and the personnel. So wow. Uh, wow. do you, uh, do you flight sim at all or you don't have time or is that something that interests you at all? Oh, it definitely interests me. Actually, uh, me and XP uh, might be needing up to uh, let me get on the sticks for a little bit, so that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> Do yeah. you have a home yeah. sim, or you got to go to XP's house? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not not a home sim yet. Maybe one, maybe one day, but for, for the time being, it'll be XP's. But you got a good connection over there. XP will tell you everything you need to get, man. Don't, or if you can't, just start, go over to man. his house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you right now, don't start flight simming because it's a slippery slope down to every single controller you want, a bigger TV, a new computer. It it gets away from you, man. Absolutely. But, you know, see, look, David David Gomez is in chat. He said he works for WFS. And he goes, hey, I had a lot of crews report me for talking to them too much. Also set a bad example as being a loadmaster, but riding around on the empty dollies while my coworker pulled me along. Oh, God. That's a screwing off on oh, a ramp. Blue. <laughs> do you do that, Blue? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, word. no. They, they, that is highly frowned upon. Um where I work it, it at. Hap yeah. It, it, it happens, man. <laughs> I mean, what, what's the worst thing you've ever, you've ever had to document or write up or report that you've seen in your job? Um, uh, I've been out on the ramp, and I've, I, I've seen aircraft uh, during pushback almost be pushed back into other aircraft, and luckily we've stopped it in time. Um, mm. More so, more common that stuff is just a, really like what I was hitting on earlier, really approaching those aircraft with the beacon on with the engine still spooling is the main one because that's where it's coming back. Oh, people are trying to get this aircraft in, trying to download the bags. Oh, we're trying to get burst bag on the belt and all that. And that's where like people really do forget how dangerous a, a spooling engine is. Um, let me think. Um, some other major items. Um, like what we were saying earlier, it's a lot of it is regulatory. Um, I do take a look at training records as well to make sure, obviously, everyone's trained and qualified to do what they're doing out there on the ramp. But kind of obviously having a close call and or what we call a near miss event in the industry, um, 
um, that's kind of my biggest event that I've seen. Luckily, I haven't been present for anything big or an aircraft damage. Wow. That's good. We we had a jetway fall in a van. <laughs> Actually, oh, well, no. I'll they, tell you, they, let me, me reword re that: a jetway back into a van. Um, thankfully, that was okay, not us. So, um, it was not us. It was not not our yeah. company. <laughs> So our yeah, I'm um, at my um, my previous job when I was saying I was doing some uh, the investigation. So not only did I do um, aircraft ground damages, I also did equipment damages. And actually, it's more common than you think to back away a jet bridge and actually run it into a piece of equipment. So that's why you see a lot of times now, I'm sure you know, Blue, that they actually have the jet bridges where they have those cameras installed for the person who's operating the jet bridge to actually look and use that camera. But still, sometimes, obviously, there's blind spots in cameras. I know um, – and in a past event, we actually had mitigations where even though they have that camera go out there and make a visual check, there'll be some instances where you have someone on the ground that actually has to give maybe a thumbs up or some type of signal that it's safe to move the jet bridge back. So equipment damages are, are a thing too that I was investigating as well. Wow, it seems like a whole different world going on outside than what we stare at through the window as passengers of the terminal. <laughs> that is does. nuts. Let me say, by the way, um, I'm just realizing in chat, there's a bunch of guys stepping up saying that they also, they are ground people here. Um, yeah, we uh, got I know David, S Flyboy in the chat, uh, yeah. a few other people we in got, the chat. We got Chris, we got uh, a guy, um, Sim Dad, he works out of Seattle. There's a lot of ground people interested in flight simulation. I wonder why, you know? <laughs> I so, wonder why. <laughs> I wonder why. Yeah, that's that's something else. Um, did you used to take any pictures at all when you were out there? Or that's not something you should like, aviation photography? Because I know sometimes when you get on a ramp for the first time, that's all you want to do. Just your, your head is on a swivel all the time. Or did you just, you got over that real quick as far as... Uh, uh, yeah, I'll still take pictures of the aircraft. I mean, like I was saying, I, I still love aviation being around these um, wide-body aircraft and I'll take pictures, but never really focused in uh, taking pictures and like sharing it on a page or anything. So gotcha. just out of curiosity, I know we talked a little bit about, you know, your mom was an ATC controller, which is amazing. Um, and that kind of got you, I guess, a bit interested in aviation. But like, what was really the thing that got you, if you remember it, like a time? Like, what, what was it that really got you into aviation? Um, yeah. Hmm. Probably like, just kind like of pick back off the thing. Why do you like aviation? <laughs> what is it about yeah. it that, that really sparks you? Honestly, the aerodynamics of an aircraft and why these huge pieces of equipment can fly. Like, I mean, like what we were talking about with uh, seven fours and even the dream lifter, it's how these things fly. It's a, uh, it's, it's amazing. So, uh, just kind of the curiosity behind that and then kind of, Moving over into the safety aspect of it really kind of feel like I saw my niche there. And it, like I said, it really interests me and I love to get out there and kind of be involved in it on the daily. So does this job pay well? I mean, you don't have to tell us a price. I'm just curious for us out there who are like, I'm interested. I've, I've had people ask me all the time since I'm working on a ramp, like, should I work at the ramp or what other aviation jobs are out there that I could look into? You know, because some people may already work at a specific, some, you know, at some aviation job and want to move up to something else, but they don't know what is available, like what, what's out there. So like, is it something like, is it paid decently or is it take time to move up first and then you get paid? Like, how does that work? Uh, yeah, most definitely it, it pays decently. Obviously I'm not getting senior, senior captain pilot pay, but, um, but definitely it, I will say like the, a good place for someone to start, they would want to do something like me as well would be just starting on the ramp because you are going to see the operation firsthand. You are going to have that firsthand experience and know what to look for. You might know where people might cut corners and kind of know where to say, Hey, we need to uh, follow this procedure. Another thing when I go out there too is following procedures. When you explain it to someone or you have a little side chat, hey, I saw you do this, you got to explain the why behind these things. And once an individual will know the why behind it, it kind of really hits them. Yeah, I could see the advertising for this job. <laughs> if you are the kind of guy who notices shortcut and safety on the ramp, a safety auditor might be the job for you. Because, <laughs> you know, some people, as Blue was saying earlier, could care less about the job. They're, they're oblivious to what's going on. They just know their little tunnel vision thing. And there's some other people are just curious. Go, hey, man, that cart's in the wrong place. That set up wrong. That does wrong. I mean, I guess maybe that's the kind of person you want to have on your team as an auditor, right? Oh, yeah, most definitely. I mean, like we were saying, uh, your head's got, really got to be on a swivel out there. I mean, so many things to look at. There's always so much going on with ground handling, whether it be fueling other aircraft, to loading of baggage, loading of passengers. 
um, there's always so much going on. I want to say, uh, apparently, I guess, so this is my first step to becoming an auditor. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, hey, you never know. <laughs> you never know. I mean, uh, do you work uh, f by yourself, as a team, as a group? Uh, how, does that, how does that run? Is it just you out there by yourself, or you have a, a bunch of or Like, uh, how many auditors would a typical major carrier have, you know, and so forth? Oh, yeah. So there will be um, a team of us auditors. Obviously, um, typically when we go out on trips, it, it'll just be my, myself individually going out and doing this. I will say in a bigger location where we have multiple flights, a lot, a lot going on in the operation. We will sometimes send two people out there just to divide and conquer with everything we need to look at. Like what I was saying earlier, everything from when it gets accepted from trucking into the warehouse, everything to where that flight actually departs and gets pushed back. Man. All right. So favorite international destination. And then I have a follow-up question after that. What's it, what was the most <laughs> international destination you've been to so far on this? Uh, I knew that was that one was coming. Um, yeah. So far, um, I would have to say over in Spain, I went to uh, Zaragoza. And that was a really cool destination, kind of city that not a lot of people would think about over there. Got to stay right in the city center over there. Great people, great food, great time. I'm going to add that to my list. I want to go there now. Right. <laughs> you sold me. The question me. is, right, because, you know, um, airplane comes in, crew gets off, they go straight to the hotel after passengers leave. Uh, how long do you have to stay at the airport and do what you need to do? And how much layover time do you actually get in the hotel to go explore? You know, uh, how does that work for you? Uh, that's a good question, too. So, um, obviously, when we're going out on audits, we want to get involved with – or involved and witness as much of the operation as we can so most of the time I'll, I'll be out there 30 minutes prior to the arrival and i will stay there until that aircraft leaves even if there is a delay and depending on how good you plan the audit that's the more time downtime that you have so definitely obviously pilots are going straight to the hotel they'll have their crew rest and then they got to fly out go wherever but uh like i was saying we'll go out there for about a week at a time internationally over the night or longer than that. So there's definitely time to explore these cities, and that's definitely another one of the perks of the job. Wow. So you get good stuff then. And you guys get regular per DM just like the crew does as well for for downline tra um, trips? Or is it straight salary? Yep. yep, we'll get a per DM on the road as well. Nice. Hey, blue career change, man. Career change. <laughs> I think Take I'm all right. I think, yeah. I think I will leave it to the DJs of the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, that's that's look, and this is why I'm happy we're we're talking to you because you know a lot of youngsters in here want to be pilots. That's the first step they want to be pilots. Everybody wants to be a pilot, but in the realities of uh, time, life, expenses to be a pilot, and the investments you have to make up front, you could still get an airline life. But there's other careers in airline industry that you can go out for, such as a, a safety auditor, that gives you similar things. You know, uh, you just have to apply yourself for it. Um, what kind of uh, you have a bachelor, as you said, but is that all that's needed? Do you even need uh, what's the minimum education wise you think you can do to get this job? Um, so there's no really requirement, I would say, to have this job, like kind of what I was saying earlier. You, if you been on the ramp for a while you have good experience you you really work your way up you show your commitment to the safety of the operation you could easily be pulled into the corporate world and be asked to join the auditing team so it's no really requirement on education i would say and is uh is this i guess job position is it kind of like like you know how there's like a pilot shortage and like i know that there's a lot of airlines hiring ramp and ground crew and stuff like that like is this a position that's being actively you know recruited for or like what's what's the, what's that look like yeah that's a good question too blue um so actually the safety industry as a whole is actually blowing up to not only in aviation safety but safety and osha as well osha related jobs it, it's all blowing up so there's definitely a need for more auditors and people in aviation safety that are doing what i do whether it be the investigators the auditors like what i'm doing there, there's plenty of opportunities out there. Jeez. Wow. Um, so do you fall under, let's see, um, what do you call that now? Uh, you fall on the ops, like and say, oh, you got to contact ops with something, like your airline ops, or what do you fall under in, in, uh, in the airline? 
Uh, so I'm not actually considered operations. I'm still um, in the safety department. Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah. So safety department basically is like a separate thing all, all by itself. Yeah. And so it's kind of interesting too. When I, when I was doing the investigator role, I really felt I was mainly corporate world. I was doing all these investigations, wouldn't really get to go out and see much of the operation. Um, but now in this role, I really almost do feel like I'm part of the operations team, but I'm still obviously uh, behind a desk, writing up my audits, doing what I have to do on that side. But I also do get to experience that operation. I will be on the ramp for those extended delays. I'll be going through it with the ramp, clu- ramp crews having to experience that as well. So it is kind of almost a mixture of both of those worlds too, of being front line and not having to sit behind a desk the whole time. Nice, nice, nice indeed. Uh, is there a safety auditor for every single flight or just selected flights or is it do you like randomly select a flight to safety audit or how do you, uh how do you guys manage that um so typically um there's not going to be an auditor out there for every flight obviously i don't want to make me sound more like the bad guy again but it is the element of surprise not or the element of surprise of where i'm going to catch <laughs> someone being complacent not that i'm just going to come at you and throw the book but it's more like what I was saying. We're the same team trying to make sure we're following things correctly. And at the end of the day, we are protecting the airline as a whole. That, that, that's what the airline views it as. This is protection for the FAA. This is protection for our certification, op- or for our operating certificate. So that's the big part of my, part of my title to uh, regulatory compliance as well. So are yeah. you, uh, you, you work for a cargo company, right? Do you get, does your company work, do any passenger stuff or are you associated with any passenger airlines at all? Yeah, this might, uh, give it away a little bit, but, um, yeah, we do actually have some, uh, passenger operations as well. And, um, we are flying a couple passenger 747s as well. And I do actually get to audit the passenger operation side as well. And I was lucky enough with my past passenger experience to be able to, kind of get best of both worlds once again, the, the cargo nice. side and passenger side. So, um, yeah, do get hands in with the passenger life as well. The reason I asked that is because I was wondering kind of like, kind of gauge like what your benefits are like. I know you get to travel for work to audit in different cities, which is always amazing to be able to travel for work and get paid to fly. That's amazing, right? Um, but what, like, what do you get airline benefits to? Like, for example, not saying you work for this company, Delta, but if you were to work for Delta, right, then you would get Delta benefits. You get to fly for, with Delta. You get to jump, uh, not jump seat, but you get to um, get buddy passes and your family gets on, stuff like that. But when you work for cargo airlines, like like UPS, for example, I know a guy I work with who works not only for my company, but for UPS as well. And I was like, so like, what kind of benefits do you get at UPS? Do you get like free delivery? <laughs> like what? what? <laughs> so, so for you, I mean, you say you do get do passengers as well, but like what kind of benefits does this job uh, offer with your airlines? Uh, yeah, same type of thing. Uh, we'll we'll be able to fly standby um, with our contractor, our cooperating airlines, uh, just like um, other airlines will get to fly standby. So we did we do get to reap those rewards as well. Cool. Wow. <laughs> and do you, do they still have ID nineties and different different um, discounts yes. like that with other airlines? Do you have a code share or whatever? Does that still exist? Yeah, exactly. That that that's what I'm saying. Uh, flying standby with ID ninety. Yeah, I have nice. an ID nine account now. Can you believe that? Oh wow, wow, wow! <laughs> I'm Mr. Airline Man. Just for you guys are making me sick. <laughs> you can come back, I mean, XP. You can come back. I know, right? Don't worry yeah, about the money. The money's not good, but you can come back. <laughs> <laughs> true, true, true. Um, no, look, I have a safety auditor at my job, and yeah, it's the guy that we love to hate, right? Because his job, we're like, dude, what do you do? You just get to rat around and bug people, but no. You do see over time complacency sets in with different things that we do on the job that supposed to be done a specific way. But, you know, life being life, you take a shortcut here and there. Next thing you know, there's an accident. Somebody loses an eye or whatever or worse. And all of a sudden now everybody tightens up again. And then six months later, we slack off again. So I do believe that safety auditors are necessary in companies. And it, as DJ says, it does save the company money because they're rather pay you a salary then pay out an expensive claim or worse to other people, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I see it now and I understand why it's there and needed because we're humans, man. We, we, we get, believe you me, I, I've seen it on the job and stuff. 
But um, so how long do you plan on staying in this, this role? For you? Is there anything else above this for you that you would want to do or should do or thinking about doing or this is it for you where you are now? Um, are you going to stay uh, in the airline industry or what are you going to do? Oh, most definitely staying in the airline industry. I nice. think uh, David had asked if I had considered uh, getting my dispatch license. Um, definitely had considered getting my dispatch license. Kind of an end goal with being in aviation safety for myself is potentially uh, being a manager of the safety department or potentially a director of safety, the 119 for a company. And then in a the role like that, you need to either have your commercial, your A&P, or your dispatch license. So, uh, David, yeah, definitely uh, something I would be interested in doing and looking into. Wow. Because wow. to be a dispatcher, don't you like have to basically get a pilot license? That's what he was saying. Yep, you're, you're, you're pretty much the pilot on the ground. That is crazy. Yeah, because you have to like, I think I saw another interview from a dispatcher. You have to know the aircraft that they're flying on the ground, right? Like if it's a 747, for example, you have to literally be like basically rated in a 747, but you don't get the benefit of flying it. Is that how it works? Um, uh, not, not so specifically rated for the aircraft, but as far as doing the flight plan from, um, A to Z, like doing the, the flight plan, um, the fuel loads, obviously you're looking at weather. You're literally doing everything the pilots are doing pretty much except flying the aircraft. Hmm. Man, man, man. If I had known, honestly, if I had known that this was that involved, maybe I would look into that direction. When I came to Florida, become a pilot never happened for me. You know, because I love the air, airline. I mean, I can imagine how much damn jet fuel you guys sniff you and blue on the job every day. I smell like it right you know? now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like Jet A. I haven't took a shower jet a. Right, right. You, have, you, you don't get that out of your system. Um, so I guess you walk around with, with, with uh, earplugs, I guess, um, on the ramp because of the noise and stuff. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I always have my... Um... My earplugs and my vest. I always wear my vest. Always out on the ramp. I mean, we're we're following that we're following that lead. I mean, people see an auditor out there, they're gonna say, "Oh, the auditor's out here. They're wearing their earplugs. They're wearing their <laughs> vest." Obviously, you don't want to get out there and show that example to all these other people, you know. Can I tell you nice. my my ramp perspective of an auditor? Um, I've only worked at this place very shortly, uh, so I've only experienced one audit ever. Uh, when the auditor came to see our ramp operation and just everybody was just kind of like, you know, like the whole, like the station manager, like, cause you guys, like you said earlier, you let the station know ahead of time, Hey, we're coming out to audit you. Um, and so all the management and super supervisors at that station start getting tight. Like, all right, guys, auditors are coming today at five o'clock. <laughs> Make sure you're doing everything right. This, this and that, whatever. And so like, you know, I mean, yeah, we, we all know what we're supposed to do. Right. But it's not that everybody still does that, even though they should be, but they don't always do that. And so, you know, you make sure you have your uh, your ear protection. Uh, make sure you're not on your phone. That's one thing we had to do for sure uh, when our auditor came through. Um, and just a lot of different things, you know, because with my air, where I work at, I, I work for a contract, or like a contractor. And so the contractor has its rules and then the airline has its rules. And so we have to remember both sets of rules. And we're supposed mm -hmm. to actually follow the most strictest version of the rule between the two companies. It's kind of confusing. Um, it's kind of like Envoy, for example. Envoy contracts, you know, for Americans. So like, they're still American, but they're also Envoy. And you, they, Envoy has different rules than American may have. Um, and so you have to follow both of them. So it gets very confusing as an employee and as a worker. But my perspective of an auditor was just like, I remember people coming and everybody was just like, you know, we weren't even freaking talking to each other. We just... In our positions <laughs> you know it was just it was so uptight that, that day it was it was really interesting wow yeah so actually a, a couple good points um i can make on that is um obviously i haven't seen it from the station side of hey uh, working like on the ramp or something where i'm going to be informed that there's an auditor coming and like i'm a ramp employee to be like oh we need to get it together but actually believe it or not when a supervisor or station manager goes out there, starts telling all his ramp soups, hey, we have, we have an auditor coming out here. They'll try to put all hands on deck and people will start getting uptight and stuff. And actually, you might have people thinking too much and do wrong. And honestly, at the end of the day, if you follow your procedures on a daily basis, that station manager should have nothing to worry about. Hey, ramp crew, keep doing everything you're doing on a daily basis and they'll have no problem with the auditor. And then you made a good point with um, – the vendor and the airline manuals and the more stringent of the two. 
And so obviously uh, we'll have different customers and obviously our books as well that we'll have to follow. And kind of that's interesting when we go out on audits, what references we'll use um, when we're referring to these procedures. And like what you said, for us around our aircraft, we'll follow the books. But a lot of times with these customers that we have, we'll actually have our a department internally at our company review the, the, the customer the customer's policies and procedures, and we'll actually accept those policies and procedures. And once they're accepted by our company, then it comes down to, hey, we're going to take the one that meets or exceeds our standards. So that, that was a good point that you brought up, too, with the different manuals with, between a vendor and an airline, actually. Wow. Wow. So basically, the airline might have a way stricter rule than the FAA does just because they want to run, run a tighter ship. Yes. So what you're saying. Nice. <laughs> Got you. Uh, Chris in chat was saying, do you ever review ASAPs or FOQA data at your job? I'm not sure what those are. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I can hit on both of those. Um, so in this job, currently, I am not reviewing ASAPs. In my other job as an, an investigator in my old carrier, I was actually involved with the ASAPs for um, the ground department. And ASAPs are the Aviation Safety Action Program. And that's pretty much if you do something wrong, you're pretty much telling on yourself. But it's like what I was saying, aviation safety is info sharing. You're always constantly learning. There's so much new technology and new stuff that's always being implemented. So with my job now, I'm not really touching on ground ASAPs or loadmaster ASAPs or flight operations ASAPs, you name it. But we do have a team in my department that does focus on those. Um, the other side of that, the FOCO, that's the Flight Operations Quality Assurance. And that's actually some really cool stuff, too. Um, it's kind of what, what you guys do. The FOCO is actually data that's downloaded off the aircraft, and they can actually put it into these simulations. And let's say a pilot has a hard landing. Then that FOCO data team in the corporate office can actually take that FOCO data and produce the simulation and actually see pilot inputs real time what they were doing. So FOCO is actually a really interesting point, too. Um, if I was more geared and the flight ops side from the ground ops side than what I'm doing now, Honestly, FOCA is a really cool side of the uh, safety operation as well on the flight safety side too. That's more so like what I was saying, I do the ground operation safety, everything that you do on the ground, how that potentially affects safety of flight. FOCA is very much um, flight safety and flight safety. So Jeez. so literally you're creating a, recreating a simulation of exactly what the pilot did um, landing or whatever the case may be. So. Exactly, taking the FOCA data right off the airplane. That's crazy. Jeez. Your landing rate calculator. Um, like somebody <laughs> sent me a video the other day saying that the 787 will actually show you your landing rate and stuff. What, really? And Oh, yeah, in the airplane, the real one does. That's so cool. That's interesting. Yeah. And uh, what was ASAPs again? I was going to ask you. What was what was the ASAP? Is that so like that's a – that's you reporting on yourself that you made a mistake and you don't get, like, disciplined, but, you know, you get, like, a exactly. discussion. So. So the Aviation Safety Action Program, and this is more so geared for our mechanics, our dispatchers, our flight ops personnel. And so we actually have it that um, in the industry as a whole, the in-flight and loadmaster is also included in, in the ASAP program. But specifically, the ASAP program is a protection of the FAA will protect your certificate. Hey, if you told us you did something wrong, you're reporting it. And then so essentially when an ASAP would get, let's say, uh, submitted by a pilot. So let's do an example from the flight ops side. Hey, we uh, had this fix. We we missed the altitude on it. They'll report it to the company because they're not trying to affect their, their pilot certification. These ASAP reports will then get submitted to the company, and then the company will actually review these with the FAA. They'll determine if the corrective action is needed, and uh, they'll possibly implement it. Sometimes it'll just be information. Sometimes they'll even actually sit down with the pilot for this example and brief them, hey, this is what you did wrong. But um, well, going back to it's info share. This is aviation safety really is based around that and we're always learning. So I have a question. I'm not yep. sure if this is in your uh, expertise, um, but I, I do know that everybody who works in aviation does have to do some sort of training. So I wonder what, what your role is in this scenario. Uh, and that is in emergency response. You talked earlier at the very beginning about how, you know, uh, you, you know, I guess you did a lot of training in emergency response. Uh, so as a ramper myself, I, you know, I had to learn some of kind of like the regulations, some of the, 
the the big red book as we call it uh, like a lot of the different checklists we have to go through as a station uh, if an accident were to occur at our airport so i'm curious like what is that for you so say there's a scenario right you know i know we all like air disasters and watching that show and we see you know all the investigation going on and i don't believe you're part of that side but um are you at all I guess a part of any of I guess are you are you a part of that system at all? Like if if there was to be like if you, somebody, if I don't know if it, <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm trying to ask. If it's a your no no I, I got you. So um, actually in this role now I'm not doing that. We do have people that are a part of the emergency response team or what we would call the the go team. If an accident were to happen, they would go. But actually um, at my old carrier, um, I was actually really involved with the emergency response program. And so what that does consist of a lot of times at these carriers is they will have emergency response drills and they will run full scale drills and actually pick uh, not actual live flight, but real flight numbers with a departure destination arrival uh, destination. More specifically with my end on ground, you have, say, um, different checklists that you have to go through when an emergency were to happen. And um, I was actually involved with um, the station's arrival checklist at my old company and got to participate in two uh, full company-wide drills. So that was awesome uh, to participate in with as well. It was really eye-opening to see how actually every department within an airline will actually get involved with emergency response. And that's not only, obviously, accounting, but your, your communications, your media, and how it's portrayed out to the world. So... There's a lot that goes into emergency response, and especially with, um, you could even say that COVID-19, the pandem- pandemic these last couple of years, that's it's almost, I know in my past career, emergency response, that manager had to do a lot with COVID and really kind of figure this whole thing out together with their role. So um, emergency response is also a great role to be in, not only in aviation, but as a whole. And there, there's a lot to be done in, in that aspect as well, too. So with uh, without um, releasing any government secrets or need to know information, um, I have seen that in some of my training. Uh, <laughs> can you go into any more detail about exactly what that picture looks like? You mentioned like all the different teams collaborating to kind of help out to to respond to an emergency. You know, say a an aircraft crash lands on your airfield, right? Like, what does that look like, and, and what what happens? Like, what what is what does that actually entail? Like I think I think it'd be interesting. I know, like as as a flight simmer myself, I have crash landed many times, and you know oh, we we just we just we get excited when we see engine fire in the game, right in the sim, uh, because we're like, oh, that was epic. But uh, in real life, when an, an aircraft, even like that Spirit plane that like you know came down and the, everybody got out the the slides and stuff like that, even though it was what seemed to be a smaller emergency, there's a whole. Uh, Thing that happens around that so can you explain any of that um what i can say for emergency response is um like with the ntsb obviously there that's who who's that's the agency that's going to respond to any type of aviation accident or incident and it's common knowledge you can look up ntsb because the ntsb would also has a go team and the GO team will con- consist of, obviously, your different operational groups, and they're going to look at specific things, obviously. Say uh, you'll have your power plant group that's going out, part of the GO team, and when they get out to an accident incident site, their first thing is obviously being in the power plant is they're going to take a look at those engines, and that's going to be what they're looking at. Wow. So is that kind of what you were asking? Sort of. I was more asking about the airport. I, I, uh, like, like, for example, what I... I Go ahead, XP, what are you going to say? No, I was going to say that, you know, just like, as, as simple as a, 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 a wing strike, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, is it, 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 does the NTSB jump in at that point, or is it you guys who jump in at that point? Say, you know, on pushback, God forbid you, 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 you hit a wing or you hit another airplane or something like that. Uh, is that kind of disaster preparedness you're talking about on your end? Um, no, we're, we're more so talking major events. Like the, if we're pushing back and we, we strike the wing of another plane, obviously if there's passengers on board, it's a reportable NTSB event, but they're not going to send their own investigators out there for something like that. Hmm. Gotcha. That, so that that's was- more of an internal investigation by the safety department that'll take place. Gotcha. I got you. I got you. So yeah. that would be you guys then. Am I getting that right? Yeah, someone in, someone in my department. And then, Blue, you were asking about, say, the airport. So the airport, obviously, the airport 
authority, they'll have their own set of emergency response, and that's their own whole thing that they'll do and their procedures that they'll follow and that they'll act to. So that's a whole other genre as well. Gotcha. Yes, I know you mentioned the GOAT team, which is something I'm familiar with, and the GOAT team usually comes from, I believe, the specific airline, right? They, every airline has their own GOAT team of people who respond uh, from headquarters to, you know, to start sending people a different direction and stuff like that like you know for example there has to be somebody uh take care it has to be a, a a group that takes care of the families takes care of the survivors and takes care of the people who are looking for their family members right because there's a whole thing like and there's people who handle the media uh there's people who handle obviously the, the you know emergency services are the ones who handle like fires things like that on the ground but there's different areas that happen within that emergency scenario situation of, of things that I know people like me who thankfully have never been in that um, or people looking from the outside never realize how many uh, entities and teams and even airlines collaborating to come together to try to solve and make sure everybody, like you said in the beginning, comes, is able to go home safe to their families or at least find out where their families are if they were on that flight. Yeah, that's actually a... a- Good point, too, that you brought up the family assistance thing. Um, obviously, um, it would be a rough event for anyone to experience that, but let's say there is an event and you find out that your family member might have been on that aircraft, they possibly went down. Then, obviously, you're going to have people showing up to the aircraft or airport to the events that, or if it's locally, say they're waiting at the airport for someone to land and you have an event on landing. There are the family assistance people, and actually, a lot of airlines, they'll actually ask any people in the company if they want to be part of that family assistance program so if you're a part of an airline exactly and you can actually be a part of that and you're right there's a lot more that goes into that too for instance is um like setting up areas uh to keep the families away to uh console people and different stuff like that setting up like a at the hotel to get people room and board to set up a media area you're right there is a lot kind of almost behind the scenes that's going on with the emergency response as well Nice. So here's a question I definitely have to ask you. What is the worst write-up that you've ever done? <laughs> what is the worst <laughs> incident you've ever had to r- written up? Serious or otherwise? What's the worst one you had to do? Um, well, that's a good question. Either on your current job that. or your past one where you were doing yeah. incident reports. Either one. <laughs> yeah. So bad that you just had to go there. You're like, yeah, man, this can't fly. You know. So going back to – so this is actually an event that I was involved in investigating. We had um, a cone ingestion. And what? so obviously this is going – yeah, this is going back to approaching the aircraft with the beacon still on the engine spool. And someone went to go put the cones down in front of the number one engine and oh engine my God. ingested the cone. <laughs> and thank goodness that that person let go of the cone and we didn't have something a lot worse. But yeah, I'd say that was um, definitely a near-miss event. Um, I would say on the cargo side, I'm really big on dangerous goods regulation. I mean, God forbid you have an in-flight event with dangerous goods. Um, so th- the segregation of dangerous goods, obviously, in cargo is a big deal as well, too. Um, there's nine different classes of dangerous goods. And um, when that's being loaded on the aircraft, there, there's a lot of things that you have to look at when uh, you're putting that on board. So. Uh, dangerous goods is a big one, obviously a big regulatory side, but um, that that that's a big one for me that I'm always looking at. You know, that's something I didn't know until I went through training was that certain types of dangerous goods cannot be stored next to each other. Yep, you would not. You wouldn't want to have a flammable liquid next to like explosives or something like that. Obviously. <laughs> I guess what comes to mind is that um, value jet thing with the um, the oxygen canisters. You know, so uh, I guess for you, you get what, a, a list off all the dangerous goods are supposed to be shipped on an airplane, and then that's what sends you off over there to make sure that's all handled properly. Is how that works? Yeah, correct. So um, all, all the dangerous goods that are loaded on an airplane, they're going to be put on a form. It's um, what we call the NOTOC, and that's pretty much what the ground crew or the load masters loading on the airplane, they're communicating that to the flight crew, hey, we have this on the airplane. And what I was kind of going back to, or I mentioned earlier, they have these emergency response guidance on that no talk, a code of come almost like almost like what you can squawk if you would have an event like something. Gotcha. Wow. 
uh, do you get as, as deep involved as 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 to how the cargo is secured or s strapped down or tied down to the pallet? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you look that deep in your in your responsibilities? Yeah, another great question, XP. Um, definitely in cargo side, we do a lot of special loads. Um, a lot of times they will, we actually have a whole special loads department that will take a look at cumulative loads um, on the aircraft, certain positions that you don't bust limitations. And then with the weight, obviously, the required number of straps that you have to securely strap that piece of equipment or whatever you're shipping out. Obviously, um, I'll bring up the, the national crash and um, the load shift where the equipment, uh, I guess the NTSB found out the load, the, they actually had used chains to strap the vehicles and the chains weren't connected properly. They um, were on takeoff, they snapped the straps and they rolled back and they impacted uh, the back of uh, the tail where they're, I forget what exactly they hit in the plane, but they affected the Hydraulics, obviously that aircraft could not be controlled. They put it into a stall and it, the aircraft ended up crashing. So, oh my God. and actually what was interesting is what, what, what happened for the cargo industry and tie down and safety. I'm glad you brought this up, Lou, was a lot came out of that national crash with the FAA and a lot has been done since then. So there has been a lot of improvements of, oh, we're not just putting some cargo on here. We're not just going to throw a couple straps on here and say it's good there is a certain amount of straps that you're putting on there for that specific weight and you're also actually looking into those strap angles whether it be a floor angle a center line angle there's a lot of math that goes into it but they have tools in the industry now that can actually help with what what you're doing to make things easier Jeez. wow was that the, the the crash you're talking about was that the one uh, on the cargo out of background or was it a different one yep xp that was out of background yep out of background and that video was just disastrous so you know um hmm. do the regular employees know the the standards of how many straps and how many chains you're supposed to use or whatever when they're strapping down loads or they definitely need your oversight on that um so typically this will be the responsibility of the load master to know the amount of required straps and then with the assistance of the loading crew they'll oversee that the required amount of straps is being used gotcha Gotcha. Wow. Man, so much. Is Blue doing a good job when he's just tossing these bags in the, in the, in the cargo hole of the A320? <laughs> or should he be tying them down? <laughs> I'm sure Blue's doing a good job. I think uh, the, the big thing on that side, obviously, is you have your two-inch fire suppression. Um, Blue can probably tell you a lot about that. Um, an auditor on the passenger side will really get after you if you load those bags over the fire suppression line. Yeah. And so that's definitely a big item, too. Yep, yep. Uh, actually, wow. in the 320, um, there's uh, we don't tie it down. There's uh, these straps that um, that actually are dividers of the different cargo bins. There's like in, in an A321, for example, I believe there's two or three bins in the front, and then there's three more in the back behind the wing, and they're all separated by this rope. I actually did an Instagram story a couple of days ago um, of that exact thing, and basically you. It has like a little clamp. It goes to the edges of the bin, and that's what keeps the bags from falling all to the front and to the back. Um, but yeah, that's all we have to do for that. If we had, if we had like a tire or something like that, like a, a massive thing, uh, then we do have to tie that down. Wow. Yeah, and that, that that's the yeah the nettings and the bins for the baggage as well too. And actually, that actually helps with um, obviously you know too with the weight and balance when you're doing the baggage loading with um, the distribution between the aft bin and the forward bin too. So that, that's a big thing as well. Oh, nice. And there nice. does have to be, like you said, there has to be a two inch gap between the ceiling of the cargo bin and the, the highest bag or cargo for a fire suppression system in the A320. Right. Here's an interesting question. Any particular regs on animal transport in the cargo that that's, you know, that you have to know or do it, do differently. Um, any, any, anything in the regs about that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question as well, too. So, um, obviously, I think David mentioned that um, live animals can't be close to dry ice. That's kind of going back to that dangerous goods segregation <laughs> thing. So, a lot of times, animals, whether it be, you name it, I've seen pigs, dogs, tons of horses, um, those will mostly be on the main deck of the aircraft. Lower decks, um, I've seen one-year-old chicks, or chickens, chick actions, so... 
obviously if they're down there, they're, they're going to be super sensitive. So the dry ice, like something like that as well too. So segregation is a big thing for that as well. That's What's one thing that's really interesting ice? with cargo loading is again, that segregation of materials and, and livestock, like, I don't know, like for whatever reason, you know, I just, I wouldn't have thought that, Hey, don't put chickens next to dry ice, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, yeah, it makes sense. But you know, you just when you're when you're trying to load a plane, you're like, all right, well, these chickens weigh this much, this dry ice weighs this much. They just happen to be loading in a certain time. Throw them in there together. Um, but but yeah, and it, but yeah, obviously these cargo companies have been going for so long that they have uh, learned, I'm sure, from experience and complaints from customers. Like, hey, my my animal came back and it was not alive because of this reason or something like that. You know, so okay, enlighten me here. What's the deal with the dry ice? What am I missing? Yeah, tell about dry ice. Tell them all the rules about dry ice. <laughs> uh, well, so dry ice is uh, class nine. It's going to be, it's just it's fumigation that could come off of it that the animals could possibly inhale. Um, uh. So I want to kind of hit on, I guess, we'll, we'll move a lot of perishables, for instance, whether it be vegetables, flowers, or something like that. And actually through the usually airline systems, for perishables, and obviously if there's live animals, that's what got me into this thought, you'll actually have to have a specific temperature range for the whole flight to ensure that those perishables and most definitely those live animals are able to stay alive and be able to breathe and um, arrive to that destination alive. So um, that's a big thing, too, that is also monitored by the airlines. And kind of more importantly on the business side is the customers, say, for instance, flowers. If those flowers go out of that temperature range, they're going to come out to the airline and, hey, we get our load. Why are all these flowers looking like they um, discoloration or whatever? So that's definitely a big part of it, too. Jeez. Wow. And what's now the I know limit why... <laughs> on dry ice for you guys? What was that? What's the limit of dry ice for you guys? I know every aircraft type and airline have like a, a limit to, to the amount of dry ice that can be transported. Uh, I'm not going to try to guess and give you a number off the top of my head, but, um, <laughs> this is a different test. aircraft. It's yeah. audit of the auditor. <laughs> get the problem to quiz. So different yeah. aircraft have different requirements, I guess, because of space or something. Well, well dangerous good. You can ship stuff and what's also called limited quantities as well too, where the kind of, not the regulations are less stringent, but they're, if it's limited quantities, you're allowed to carry it with almost less regulation, so to speak. Got you. Got you. Got you. Wow. That's so much, man. Um, I'm just listening here going, wow, wow, wow. I mean, I worked as a flight attendant, but, you know, being a charter airline that I used to work for, you get a lot more time on the ramp itself and see things and notice things and pay attention. But I still didn't know that there was a lot of this, what you do that goes on behind the scenes. That I, you know, I would think that the auditor just comes around once every two months and make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to and go back behind the desk. But sounds like you're way more active than that in, um, in, in, in what you do. So half, half desk job, half ramp person. Is that how you, you describe it? Yeah, and kind of that's what I was saying. It's the best of both worlds, and I really didn't get to experience it much as an investigator, but now as an auditor, yeah, I get to go out, see the operation as a whole, and kind of be out there when they're doing everything firsthand. And then obviously getting back and being in the corporate world too, and being involved in meetings and different briefings, having to follow up on corrective actions. Obviously, a big part in doing an audit is uh, you're documenting everything you find from the observation or finding to the corrective action you get. To say, for instance, the FAA were to come and evaluate your, your programs, you would be able to show this documentation of how you're in compliance with SMS, which is required now by the wow. FAA. Gotcha. All right. I got one last question for you, and I promise you no more. Um, <laughs> out of all the airplanes that you've worked on and flied on, flew on and jump seat on, in your opinion, which is the best or which do you prefer? What's your best airplane? What would you say it was? Queen of the Skies. 747. I knew he was going to say that. I, I could tell he was a 747 guy. I knew it. Nice. Nice. <laughs> nice. Nice. That's amazing. Wow. That's what I believe. I man. do have one question, too. And I know you don't work like mm -hmm. the operation hands, usually hands on, but I know you're around it. So when you have been around the ramp, you know, uh, operation and the loading of, of the goods, what is the most exotic or crazy thing or or commodity or whatever that you've seen transported 
Mm, good question. Mm, oh, that's a good question. Some of the cooler things besides, I mean, anytime an animal I see on the load plan that an animal is either going out or coming in, I, I'll always jump up there and see how they're doing, whether it be horses to dogs or whatever it may be. But definitely those special loads are kind of cool, too. When you see a, a helicopter, obviously disassembled, being loaded on a 7-4, being, getting ready to be shipped down to South America, that's really cool. And then uh, I know we, we had some... Uh, contracts too where we were actually moving a bunch of formula one cars and seeing okay you sold me i'm done i want to be an auditor (laughs) (laughs) nice you said formula one cars (laughs) how do you i mean which airplane do you transport that on i mean what kind of pallets do you put that on seriously most of that stuff's obviously going to be on 747s these are special loads and a lot of these special loads obviously on these 747 400 these freighter aircraft they they obviously have their nose that opens up too and um another, another thing i want to bring up too is a lot of times that you'll see that these cargo airlines are actually taking old passenger 747s and what they're called now is their 747 bcfs Boeing converted freighters. So their whole lifespan of flying as a passenger plane was done. And then they actually do a conversion and they'll put a locking system in there, put a main cargo door on there. But those BCF aircraft are specific because they actually don't open at the nose, obviously, because it used to be a PAX aircraft. Right. And then there's also some different tie down regulations and different stuff to that. So they just like so yeah, worry the, about the all special- the carpet and seats and that's it? Yep, putting that cargo loading system in there. And then you could actually go on uh, YouTube and actually look at some pretty cool videos of the conversion, them cutting the holes for the main cargo deck door on the side of a 7-4. And uh, that's some cool stuff. And a, and a thing that is a special load that you see quite often, too, that's uh, triple sevens will carry them as well and several seven fours all the time is these aircraft engines. So, obviously, aircraft maintenance is a big thing, too. These engines have to go to heavy check, OC check, and all this stuff to, in, to their overhauls. So, You'd be amazed by how many aircraft engines are constantly flying around on these cargo planes, too. Hmm. And so not only will there be cargo on there, but there will sometimes be an engine in the middle of that plane, too, all tied down and stuff as well. So it's amazing what we can put on these aircraft. I feel like when the cargo industry first came out, they were like, oh, we're moving boxes from x to z from a to b destinations. But now where we come to what we can move on these aircraft, it's amazing. So I was talking to a cargo pilot yesterday and it kind of brought up the topic and I'm sure I'll bring this up again in the future when we speak to an actual cargo pilot, but like uh, how much money do you think cargo airlines as a whole are making compared to like passengers? Like, is it, is it greater? Is it less? Do you think moving commodity is more than moving people? What do you think? Hmm. Another good question. I mean, the moving of people has obviously been a big thing for a long time now. The moving of freight cargo by air is obviously been done, but the the capacity and the volume of how it's being done nowadays, hey, how are you doing all your Christmas online shopping? Yeah. And then how is that going to get moved? A lot of that is going to be air freight. So it's crazy that the way the world is becoming, how much the cargo industry actually has grown too. So that, that it, it's definitely a growing industry. You remember, yeah. you remember back in the wow. day where you had the option to choose ship via ground? <laughs> <laughs> and now it's just like, all right, it'll be there this time. <laughs> we'll yep. get it tomorrow. <laughs> that is nuts. Wow. 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 Wonderful world of aviation, man. I, I, I love it. And you know, I'm so happy that you uh, came on the show with us and give us a different side, a different perspective of it. Um, one of the things that we decided on the Blue Experience uh, podcast is that we're just going to bring on everything aviation. We're not going to stick to just flying the simulator all the time or talking to sim pilots or developers, just as important as pilots. But you know, having a safety auditor on board, man, is, is great, man. DJ, appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, um, by the way, anything that you wanted to say to us that we haven't covered also in your job responsibilities or roles or any advice for us? Uh, honestly, I think we kind of covered all our corners on it, but um, I really appreciate Blue XP having me on here. I hope um, this definitely gave a different perspective of what you can do in the airline industry and the different types of perks and different experiences that you can have. And maybe even hopefully inspired someone to pursue a role like this because there's a lot to be done. And if you're passionate about anything, you can really, really get into it and really enjoy it. So 
I really say if someone's interested in doing something as aviation safety, go after it because the industry is out there. That's amazing. I have one comment here I want to kind of highlight, uh, kind of responding to what I just said. Uh, he says, it's a uh, ridiculous about, let's just say that, uh, see, cargo makes enough for airlines such as China Eastern to fly two 777-300s a day in Chicago with no passengers, strictly uh, belly and cabin cargo, while still paying a flight crew of seven for each flight. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and that's just what's amazing now is I'm sure you guys know a lot of these pack, passenger carriers were actually using their passenger aircraft and just putting cargos in the lower decks during this whole pandemic, and they, they were obviously benefiting and making profit off this. And like yeah. what we were saying, the way yeah the way the world is coming to you now just with air freight and um, kind of actually in the current situation with um, – I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the shipping containers on the ships and the port issues – that's mm -hmm. kind of really given this kind of spark and, hey, if we can't get it there by ship, we might have to pay a little extra money to get there by plane. And so business really is booming on the cargo side, aviation-wise. Nice. Wow. I yeah, would love to spend like a whole day on a major – cargo airlines route like not route but uh like ramp just to see, i just want to see like what they're putting in there like i would love to see an elephant being loaded a formula one car uh you know a uh, spaceship engine you know i just you know anything you can imagine i'm sure they're shipping by air i would love uh to just be able to witness that and just to see how they handle it where they put it on the plane how the load master decides hey put this right here right above the wheels or right on the whatever you know because i know that's pretty difficult for them to do but um yeah it's really cool hearing uh your perspective and hearing your experience and it sounds like a lot cooler job than i thought to be honest with you i was like an auditor hmm what is that about but you have some really nice perks man you get the right jump seat that just blew my mind uh and you are also a certified load master as well and it sounds like you get to go to a lot of cool places so definitely man it sounds like you found i want to sound like you found like a passion of yours right it's a lot of people hate their jobs right they go there they just hate being there they don't want to do this whatever but it sounds like you found a way and you found an avenue you found a job that you can actually appreciate that's also not only going to pay you but also you love right which is is great i think it's something i really and try to inspire people to always try to find like yeah, yeah you got to have those those leading jobs right where it's like it's going to lead to something better uh, or lead to the thing that you actually want to do but it's great whenever you can find a, a job like yours and it sounds like you said as well as you don't have to have some crazy degree like, even though you have one right which makes you even more qualified i'm sure but you don't technically have to have uh, a freaking 10 year degree or something crazy to, to get into this position that pays not too bad so man, thank you again yeah blue definitely and i think you hit that too uh, I, I do really love what i'm doing and bringing up the load master thing that is another great venue obviously if you're not going to be flying the plane but to be loading these planes and when you're the load master a lot of times if you're not at actual base you're flying with that aircraft you're loading it you're getting on with the crew and you're flying to all hmm. these places around the world so for all those people out there that want to fly and want to travel that maybe don't have the means to actually be able to go through their flight training look into being a load master and maybe even start out on the ramp get some experience and then jump over to being a load master like that's also a great opportunity and great way to travel the world and really be really involved in the airline industry learn all these policies which is procedures and if you want to go the safety route, having that operational experience really does help. I might look into that myself. <laughs> yep, I mean, exactly. I, I am a loadmaster <laughs> now, but, you know, I'm a loadmaster for a smaller aircraft for, you know, the Airbus uh, fleet. Uh, so it's a bit different than, you know, being a loadmaster for a 747, you know, freighter. That's, that's a completely different type of loadmaster. Um, and I have a different respect for that. So I think it'd be pretty cool, you know, because when it comes to those type of loadmasters, like my, me as loadmaster, I don't fly with my plane. I don't go nowhere with my plane. I'm only at my station. You know, if they need me <laughs> somewhere else, like another city, you know, to work there for a few days, and I can do that. But I don't like, unlike, you know, loadmasters for like, you know, your airline or cargo airlines, you don't travel with that ship, you know. So that's a pretty cool job. I think people, should, should, you guys in chat, go be a loadmaster. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And then another opportunity for loadmasters too is a lot of people kind of overlook is the the military, the air force, the, the army. They all have loadmaster positions too, and they're traveling on these C fives all around the world. Mm -hmm. So imagine loading a C five with all this uh, military equipment. So all this explosive there, material. <laughs> definitely a, a lot of opportunities out there, and it, the world is at your fingertips if you want to go out there and explore it. That's amazing, man. That's amazing. Definitely. definitely.
Wow. Wow. I love Aviation. That's all I can say. I do too. End the story, man. End the story. Well, folks, you've heard it here today. It's another blue experience in the books. As I said, it's going to be available on Spotify and other platforms to come, plus on YouTube, as we always do it, man. Shout out to DJ. Thank you so much, DJ, for being a part of this one. I am I was riveted. I've got to say, let me just say this live. I was riveted listening to you talk about that aspect that I've never actually thought about or considered existed. And, and I appreciate you sharing that with me, man. I'm going to go do some more thinking now. <laughs> Blue, <laughs> what, what, you, what you got coming up, man? Oh, uh, man, uh, besides work and working on videos for YouTube, uh, I am planning to go live tomorrow. Um, you have to stay tuned to find out what I do. Uh, but I do plan to go live tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, what about you? Yeah, uh, Friday night out. Well, no, not no, no F and O. It's gonna be the XPO to, tomorrow. I think I'm nice. probably gonna do like Copenhagen down to Heathrow or something like that. Finish up my European tour, and then um, one more in the weekend, and that's it. So tomorrow, regular time, guys, 6 p.m. Eastern. We'll be at it hopefully, and um, <clears throat> keep the flying going. Absolutely, and then have, have DJ come by this weekend and take a look at all this equipment here. Oh boy, <laughs> you really should. You should really have DJ over if if you don't yeah, live too far. Yeah. Go over there, and check it. I'm, I'm gonna warn you right now, DJ, because <laughs> I know what he got. When you go over there, you are gonna end up wanting to buy your own equipment. So just be careful, and, and it's kind of like walking into a. Uh, for me, it's like walking into an Apple store and knowing you're not gonna buy nothing, but you want everything. Uh, so that's the kind of minds that you have to have when you go to XP. It's like, hey, I want it all, but I'm, I'm not. I'm not gonna buy it. You have to. Nice. You have to decide before you go that you're not gonna buy it, or you'll be broke next week. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> most, most definitely. I can't can't wait. And thanks again, XP and Blue. Uh, it's been a pleasure getting to talk, talk with you all tonight. Really enjoyed it. And stay tuned next week, guys. We got more special guests coming up. We we have a lineup coming up, man. Just let me just leave it like that. It's gonna be good. Appreciate it. Blue experience. Blue, run the track. <laughs> Remember, you have three choices. Give up, give in, and give it all. You got peace, love, and God bless you. We will see you guys next time. Next Blue Experience. We out of here. Hey. Later. Bye.